Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to the show. Today's topic is George Washington, Part 4. Last time we were, we left George Washington and the Continental Army at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. That very tough, historic time. And there was a reference, a quote from Alba Gents Waldo. This fellow had a very graphic depiction of the, of the severe hardships the men were going through. And uh, he made a reference, he, he said, um, uh, about how bad the food was. That the food was so bad, it was, it, that it could, it, that it, could uh, it was sickish enough to make a Hector spew. Now, when he used the word Hector, that, that's a reference to ancient Greece. And, uh, you know, back in the, 1800, or the 18th century, Americans were much more uh, knowledgeable about ancient Greece and Rome. And Hector was a character in the famous novel, The Iliad, uh, by Homer, the f who was a great ancient Greek author. Homer, no, no, no relation to Homer Simpson. Okay, so I thought that was pretty interesting. So, here we are, it's near, they're coming through the, the, the very tough winter at Valley Forge, and George Washington wrote this at that time. This is early 1778, quote, Perseverance and spirit have done wonders in all ages. Washington, as I said, already was a prayerful man. Prayer was very important to him. He got a lot, he needed help, and he got, he got, a, he got a lot of help from God through, through his prayers. His grandson, George Washington Custis, wrote this, quote, Throughout the war, as it was understood in his military family, he gave a part of every day to private prayer and devotion. In February of 1778, France joined the war. Now they had been weighing their options. France was the other superpower along with Great Britain and those two had been enemies. So as they say, the enemy of your enemy is your friend. And But they'd been biding their time trying to see you know, if the American cause had any chance of winning. And they finally decided that the Americans could win. So they joined the war on the American side. And this was a very, very important uh, move because we needed help. And France provided a lot of help for us. So we, we have a debt that we owe them for our freedom. A very interesting man arrived in, um, in, um, at, uh, at Valley Forge in, uh, in February 1778, Baron von Steuben. And his, he was an officer, a lieutenant general in the Prussian army. His full name was Friedrich Wilhelm Ludolf Gerhard Augustin Baron von Steuben. And uh, he had served under Frederick the Great in, um, in, in Europe. Frederick the Great was the great king of Prussia. Now, uh, this uh, fellow, Baron von Steuben, came and... Uh, wanted a meeting with Washington and he got that meeting and at that meeting he said his English was very limited but he offered his services. Now he knew how, how to drill troops, how to teach them to march and how to maneuver in ranks and how to use bayonets. You know when you're in battles and these types of battles they fought the, the soldiers really have to be coordinated and work as a team just kind of like a football look at a foot, NFL football team you know, they have, everybody has to be doing the exact the thing that, that, that they need to do, otherwise it falls apart. Same thing in these types of battles in the war. And otherwise guys are bumping into each other and it, it becomes a mess. You know, they, uh, so anyway, he offered his services to Washington and Washington accepted them. So uh, Baron von Steuben was a German who played a major role. He's a great hero of the American Revolution because his drilling and what he taught these, these men at Valley Forge uh, was useful and helped the American army win battles later. And furthermore, he uh, wrote instructions to officers, to captains. Quote, a quote from Baron von Steuben. A captain cannot be too careful of the company the state has committed to his care. His first object should be to gain the love of his men by treating them with all possible kindness and humanity. He should know every man of his company by name and character. He should often visit those who are sick, speak tenderly to them, see that the public provision, whether medicine or diet, is duly administered, 
and procure them, besides such comforts and conveniences as are in his power. The attachment that arises from this kind of attention to the sick and wounded is almost inconceivable. inconceivable. Now these are wonderful, amazing words. And it taught, you know, if you think about war and what men go through and how there has to be strict discipline and punishment of, for um, a misbehavior or laziness or incompetence or whatever. Uh, but at the same time, he's talking here about how the officers need to be kind and need to love the men, you know, for morale, because morale is so important in war, it's so important in all of life, and especially in war, because it's so it's so tough. Nobody wants, to, it's hard to die, and it's hard to kill other men. So, it's, you know, going into battles is very, very hard. So, they need, so for morale, you need, they, the men need to feel they're loved. And so this is, I think, an incredible uh, philosophy that he's explaining here. And from what I've read, it, it is the cornerstone of American army, philosoph army philosophy of leadership today. So God bless Baron von Steuben. Wonderful. Now, there, was a, there were villains at Valley Forge. One of those villains was Thomas Mifflin, the, the uh, quartermaster, the guy in, in charge of supplies. And he was lazy and incompetent and plotting against George Washington. One of the very sad things that was going on during Valley Forge, Pennsylvania farmers were making big profits selling food to the British in Philadelphia, while American soldiers at Valley Forge starved. Terrible. Anyway, finally, uh, Washington replaced this Thomas Mifflin with Nathaniel Green, who went on to become, who was quartermaster for, for about uh, a couple years, and who went on to be a great hero in the Revolution. Now, one thing to remember is during Valley Forge, during that winter of 77-78, the British were in Philadelphia, and they were in heated homes, and they were eating good food, and the officers were going to parties with the high society ladies and gentlemen of Philadelphia. And meanwhile, at Valley, not too far away at Valley Forge, the American army was starving and freezing, and the British could have wiped them out if they attacked, but they didn't. So that's really something. In, in 1778, at this time, there was, you know, back then, there was no television, no movies, so they had live plays. People would do storytelling, or if they wanted to be a little more organized and a little more fun, you know, there were, there were live actors who would travel from town to town. Now, Washington decided to have a play performed for the troops at Valley Forge using uh, actors from the soldiers. And this was the play called Cato, which had been written in 1713 by Joseph Addison. And it was the most popular play in America at the time, and George Washington's favorite play. Now the story is, uh, it is in, the story is about, uh, or takes place in ancient Rome, and uh, it depicts the story of Marcus Porteus, who, uh, who was opposing the Julius Caesar dictatorship, in ancient Rome. So it was a story of uh, you know the hero against the villain. And in this case, uh, Julius Caesar was the villain. And uh, you know, I feel a little bit bad about it because I just read a biography of Julius Caesar, and you know, when he was stabbed to death and betrayed by the senators, I thought, oh, this is terrible when that happened and on the Ides of March and everything deteriorated in ancient Rome after that. And then there's the famous story when Caesar was coming home from France, and uh, he wasn't supposed to bring his army. Uh, and, and when he crossed the Rubicon River, you know, with his army, this was a violation of, of law. And it was, you know, so he said, I have crossed the Rubicon, and that became an expression, crossing the Rubicon. Another interesting thing is that George Washington, as a young man, at Mount Vernon, ordered four busts for his home. And now a bust is like a statue from the chest up, the chest and the head. He ordered busts of Alexander the Great, the great uh, uh, warrior from ancient Greece, Julius Caesar, this great uh, uh, leader from ancient Rome, Frederick the Great, uh, you know, this Baron von Steuben had served under in Prussia, and uh, Charles XII of Sweden, when, when Sweden was a superpower. So that's uh, pretty interesting. Thomas Fleming, the modern historian, wrote this, quote, about Valley Forge, quote, all the senior officers had drawn strength 
from the men in the huts, and he's talking about the common soldiers, whose only eloquence was their patience and endurance. No one drew more spiritual meaning than their commander-in-chief. Remember his eyes, brimming with tears, as he talked with the soldiers who came to his headquarters to respectfully report their hunger. The soldiers in their huts, the steadfast man who led them with a courage and compassion, still shine in the soul of the American Republic. See, again, I want to bring out that George Washington was a kind man. He was very kind. And this, this, uh, and, you know, this is not just about George Washington, but all the fellows there, we should remember them. It's a respectful thing to do. And what they went through for us in helping to build our country. God bless the men who were at Valley Forge, those who died and those who lived to continue the fight against Great Britain. Another very interesting thing is that there were 47 Oneida Indians in the Continental Army. In a skirmish uh, with the British outside Philadelphia in early 1778, they did very well, and Washington was very impressed. And so he actually appointed one of them, Louis Ataya Tagrongta, a lieutenant colonel. This, and he was a St. Regis Mohawk Indian in the American Army. There were seven Oneida and two Tuscaroras lower, who, who were appointed lower-ranking officers. Now, the thing that the Indians had that the Americans didn't have was that they used sound. They would scream in battle. You know, this... You've seen the movies with the cowboys and Indians, and that's, it's true. And, you know, it, it, it's very powerful. Sound is a very effective weapon. And uh, you can use this if you're being attacked, you know, you know, this, that you can, if you scream loud enough, it can startle whoever's attacking you. Uh, and anyway, this is what the, so anyway, this is very interesting. Now, by June, the uh, British evacuated Philadelphia. They had taken it and pretty much uh, wrecked it and ruined it, and uh, they used, uh, they used Independence Hall, where the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence had been signed as a big toilet. Anyway, so they withdrew from Philadelphia, which meant that the Congress could return and Philadelphia could continue to be the American capital. Okay, after they cleaned up the big mess there. In April of 78, uh, Charles Lee, remember who had been a prisoner, was captured by the British, he was exchanged in a prisoner swap. Now, the thing is, Lee had become a traitor during his time with the British, and he agreed to work for them, but that was not known by... George Washington. Now, one of the most important battles in the war was fought in June of 1778 at Monmouth Courthouse. Charles Lee, this general who had just been released, was given uh, leadership for that battle. Now, as the British uh, had left Philadelphia, they were retreating across, they were moving across New Jersey toward New York City. And uh, Washington ordered an attack at this place, Monmouth Courthouse. Now, during the battle, uh, General Lee, for his, because he was a traitor and wanted to hurt the American cause, he ordered a retreat in the middle of the battle, which would have been a disaster because the British were, gonna, were going to attack and, uh, and really annihilate the army. Now, Washington, who was in the back, saw all these men coming toward him, and you know he raced his horse to, to, the, to the front. And uh, this is near Freehold, New Jersey. And Washington was yelling orders to continue the fight, to turn around and, and continue the fight. And what would have been a defeat turned into an American victory. Uh, Lafayette, who we're going to talk about in a little bit, was a French uh, volunteer, and he had this to say about the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse. Quote, George Washington seemed to arrest fortune with one glance. His presence stopped the retreat. By his own presence, he brought order out of confusion animated his troops and led them to success. Again, many times Washington could have been killed in battle during the Revolution as bullets were flying all, all, all around him. Now if you go to the Monmouth Courthouse battlefield today, you will see, there's a statue for Baron von Steuben because uh, at, at that battle the British lost 1,200 men, killed, wounded, or captured. And the training that von Steuben had done at Valley Forge paid off. So this, uh, that's why they have the statue for him, a great hero of the American Revolution, Baron von Steuben. After the battle, George Washington, 
the, uh, had the men rest for two days, and then he gave the order, quote, The men are to wash themselves this afternoon and appear as clean and decent as possible, that we may publicly unite in thanksgiving to the supreme disposer of human events for the victory, which was obtained over the flower of British troops. Major victory, Monmouth Courthouse. And Washington had everyone thanking God for his help. Uh, Washington went on and said he believed the, the, the battle would have been lost, but for, quote, that bountiful providence which has never failed us in the hour of distress. So this, uh, another interesting international fellow came uh, from France, a French nobleman. His full name was Marie Joseph Paul Yves Roche Gilbert de Mottier, Marquis de Lafayette. He was a young man in his 20s, came from a noble family in France, very wealthy family, and he came to offer his services like Baron von Steuben. And he met with Washington, who apologized for this ragtag army that he had. And, uh, you know, this uh, Lafayette was this uh, very well-dressed uh, nobleman. And Lafayette responded, quote, It is not to teach, but to learn that I come hither. So this Lafayette had a very... It was a very humble man, a very good man. Uh, and he was at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse. After that battle, Washington and Lafayette slept on the ground under one blanket. Now this is one of the nicest stories in this, uh, this the, the story of George Washington, the, the relationship that he had with Lafayette, because Lafayette became like a son to him, and Washington was like a father to Lafayette. Lafayette's father had died when he was very young. And Washington, of course, father, didn't father any children. He had this stepson that he didn't really, uh, wasn't close to because he was so lazy. So there was a very wonderful, positive, loving relationship, a father-son relationship between George Washington and Lafayette. Earlier, Lafayette in Paris had been dancing a quadrille with Queen Marie Antoinette, and he fell on his face becoming the laughing stock of Paris. So he was a young man trying to uh, redeem himself and, and prove himself and show that he uh, uh, could accomplish something. Washington wrote this about Lafayette, quote, I do not know a more noble soul, more honest, and I love him as my own son. Washington and Lafayette exchanged letters through the years. Washington wrote to Lafayette, quote, the sentiments of affection and attachment which breathe so conspicuously in all your letters to me are at once pleasing and honorable and afford me abundant cause to rejoice at the happiness of my acquaintance with you. Your love of liberty, the just sense you entertain of this valuable blessing, and your noble and disinterested exertions in this cause of it added to the innate goodness of your heart, conspire to render you dear to me, and I think myself happy in being linked with you in bonds of strictest friendship. Wonderful, wonderful. Lafayette wrote to Washington, quote, The moment I heard of America, I loved her. The moment I heard she was fighting for freedom, I burned with a desire of bleeding for her. And the moment I shall be able to serve her at any time or in any part of the world will be the happiest one of my life. Wow, isn't that wonderful, this man who wanted to help, you know, who wanted to help the American Revolution and was inspired by the words in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, the equality of men uh, before the law and in opportunity. Uh, Lafayette also had played a role in France as a member of a powerful family in lobbying for the French to, become, to support the U.S. in the war. Another international guy came from Poland named Thaddeus Kosciuszko, and uh, he came to offer his services as well as a volunteer. And he served in the American Revolution, and he was inspired by the American Re Revolution. So when he went home to Poland, he led a revolt against Russian rule because Poland was ruled by the Russians back then. And so he's a national hero of Poland who served in the American Revolution. On July 4th, 1778, the two-year anniversary of our independence, there was a big celebration 
for the American army in New Jersey where they, where they were located. This would be near the Monmouth Courthouse battle site. And they celebrated surviving Valley Forge and the Monmouth Courthouse victory. Interesting uh, aside here is that 40% of the Continental Army was Irish. They're from Ireland. 40%, that's a lot. Now, back then, the Ireland was a colony of Great Britain, like the North American colonies in, uh, in America. Uh, and, uh, the Brit uh, and it remained a colony into the 20th century. Um, and in, in the mid-1800s, there was the potato famine, where, where millions starved to death in Ireland, and the British bear responsibility for that. So they were, the, the Irish were very sympathetic. And anyone who would say, well, Canada was okay, that things worked out for them, but what about Ireland? Ireland was a, was a colony that really suffered under British rule. Anyway, so the Irish, because of, of their troubles with the British, were, were wanted to help win the war. In December of 1778, the British took Savannah and occupied Georgia. Now, an interesting thing, the, the, the war was fought mo almost completely on land, but there was some fighting on, on, at sea. And specifically, a battle on September 23rd, 1779, off the coast of England. And this American ship, the USS Bonham Richard, faced the British ship, HMS Serapis. They were fighting, they were firing cannons at each other, and the American ship was uh, badly damaged. And, uh, and it was sinking. And then the British ship, um, the British, ship, British called for the surrender of the American ship. The American uh, captain of the ship was John Paul Jones, and his response was, Quote, I have not yet begun to fight. Anyway, the Serapis uh, rammed the, the, the Bonham Richard, so they came together, and then there was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Guys jumped on both uh, ships, and they're fighting you know, with swords and, and pistols and so forth, and the Americans won. They won that battle. And then the, actually the Bonham Richard sank, and then they took the Serapis. So this was a great victory. John Paul Jones was a great hero in the war. And this is why. Uh, later, he went on to capture eight British ships, and he sank and burned many others. So the revolution on the sea. The following winter of 1779-1780 was spent in Morristown, New Jersey again. And it was worse than Valley Forge. Uh, Major General Nathaniel Green, who had been promoted, became one of the great uh, heroes of the war, described the suffering of the men at, at uh, Morristown, New Jersey in 7980. Quote, poor fellows, they exhibit a picture truly distressing, more than half naked and two thirds starved. A country overflowing with plenty are now suffering an army employed for the defense of everything that is dear and valuable to perish for want of food. Tough times. Washington uh, became discouraged Many times, in 79, he wrote, quote, There is every appearance that the army will infallibly disband in a fortnight. In 1781, he wrote, quote, It is vain to think that an army can be kept together much longer under such a variety of sufferings as ours has experienced. The, econ the uh, American economy collapsed in 1780 with high inflation. Uh, they were using, the Americans were using continental dollars and the value uh, plummeted very badly and the, the soldiers were being paid in continental, uh, continental dollars. And it became, uh, uh, this became another great hardship for them because those continental dollars became practically worthless. In fact, uh, in uh, uh, $400, in uh, a $400 amount, had the value of $10 before the war in 1780. The following year, the continental uh, dollar had no value. They were printing money. That's what they were doing. In May of 1780, in Charleston, South Carolina, that fell to the, to the British. <coughs> and uh, this was a disaster. There were 5,500 American prisoners taken. In 1780, the, the French Navy was going to make a landing at Rhode Island. And the British, who had made New York City their headquarters, started, to, uh, started moving toward Rhode Island to, 
to meet that uh, in, uh, arrival and to, to stop it or to fight them. And uh, now Washington had a spy network and he got, uh, he used his spy network to send a false report, a fake report that the Americans were going to attack New York City. And so the uh, British turned around and came back and the, uh, there was no American attack and the French were able to make a safe landing at Rhode Island. And this is depicted very well in the book by Brian Kilmeade from Fox News who wrote a book about Washington's spies. It's a very good book. Now Washington wrote this about uh, the suffering of his men, 1780, quote, It would be well for the troops if, like chameleons, they could live on air, or like the bears suck their paws for sustenance during the rigor of the approaching winter. Now back then there was this belief that chameleons lived on air, and of course they, they don't, they live on uh, small insects, but uh, this was a reference to Shakespeare, apparently, who had, who had mentioned this. And the bears sucking their paws, this would be a reference to bear, uh, orphaned bears who could no longer suckle at their mother and would suck their paws, kind of like a child sucking his thumb. Anyway, uh, but yeah, a bear can't live on sucking its paws. A very sad thing in, in, in 1780, uh, Benedict Arnold decided to become a traitor, and he become he. Uh, it was too. It was. It was very. It was tragic, and he decided, tried to turn over uh, West Point uh, on the Hudson River to the British, and this plot d uh, failed. So he he wasn't able to do this, but he ended up. He had to leave. He went over to the British side and became a uh, an, a general on the British side. It was very sad. And very sad that he did this. Um, had to do with his embitterment over not getting credit for Saratoga, New York, and he was. Well, he was expecting a lot of money. Uh, so he was the hero who turned into a villain and forever blackened his name, Benedict Arnold. Very sad. Now, all of the suffering that the men uh, had gone through, finally, they really were fed up with, with it, all of it, not being paid, all their suffering. And um, some of them hadn't been paid for a year. So there were two uh, mutinies in 1781, one in Pennsylvania, one in New Jersey. Now, George Washington was very sympathetic to these to the men because he knew that they had not been treated properly. They had been mistreated. They were fighting for American freedom and not being supported. You have to pay guys for stuff like this, and, and you have to feed them and clothe them, and they were not, that wasn't being done. So he was sympathetic. However, uh, he felt he had to keep discipline, so those ringleaders of the two mutinies were arrested and shot, executed. Because, uh, and then he, after this, he wrote to governors of the New England states, and he said, quote, The soldiers' calamities and distresses are beyond description. The circumstances will now point out much more forcibly what ought to be done than anything said, to, said by me on the subject. Now, he was, even though this was a heartbreaking thing for him to execute these men, but uh, he, he, had, he, he believed he had, that legitimate authority had to be obeyed. No matter how, how bad the Continental Congress was, or no matter how, how poor the support was from the states, there could not be mutiny. The, you, we were not going to become a military government, and that, that's what he had in mind. If soldiers dictated terms to their country, civil liberty was lost. You know, many countries have had generals leading them, military, uh, uh, military government. And so this is, again, a cornerstone of American life, that military authority is under civil authority, and that's what he was promoting here. Now in 81, 1781, uh, Nathaniel Green, uh, who was, uh, he, he recaptured most of the South except for Savannah and Charleston. And so this is where he really uh, became a big hero for his efforts in the South and freeing the South from British control, mostly. So now we're coming to the end of this segment. Uh, there was news. Uh, there was a major battle we'll talk about next time. Washington heard that the British war had a major force on a peninsula in Virginia. Uh, and so he, just, uh, he started moving south, and the French Navy started coming to that area. And we're going to talk about it next time, because it was the battle that won the war, the final battle of the American Revolution, although the war went on for two more years. Thanks so much for watching. We will see you next time. God bless you. 
Live long and prosper. May the force be with you.